Hi, everyone. Welcome to week 12. I hope you enjoyed the spring break. I hope you got some rest, some relaxation. I hope you went out and did something fun. I hope you're ready for the final stretch. Uh, this is the first of four final weeks, and we're going to be turning our attention towards the finals. Before we really get into that, we're going to also look at the reading for last week. It's probably been a minute. I hope you enjoyed this one. I think it's a really interesting, fun read, and I've got a lot to say about it. But even before I do that, there's a couple of follow-up points, a little bit of housekeeping that I want to mention right off the bat. First of all, you should have received an email from me today or whenever you're watching this, it was on Monday with your marks for weeks six through nine plus your second paper. If you don't see that or if you have any questions about it, if anything is unclear, please just let me know. I'm sorry I couldn't give a sort of deep analysis or critique or much feedback for your paper, but you see your mark and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And I'm hoping we'll have one more opportunity to talk about marks for that paper. You should have also seen in the past week or so comments from me on your discussion post from week 11 regarding topics for the final. As of the time of recording this right now, there were a few that were posted over the weekend that I haven't gotten to yet. So please look out for those. I'm going to try to answer them as soon as I'm finished here. It might take me into Tuesday to post all those comments, but the ideas look great. Please take a look at those comments. I hope that they're helpful. If you have any questions on that front, please also let me know. It's a critical time to be thinking about your, your final. Again, more on that at the end of this presentation. But the first round is essentially due in two weeks. We're going to talk about a presentation schedule. I have some more coming to you on that front. But know that the first round, and it, it, if you volunteer, it's actually your, your preferential treatment to anyone who uh, does volunteer early. So there's an advantage to presenting on May 9th. But we're about two weeks away from the finals. Any questions you may have about your topic, whether you want to add to those comments or email me separately, please do so. We should all be finalizing our topic and starting to turn towards some real, uh, real good research on that front. Okay. And I do want to try to uh, schedule meetings with everyone next week. So I'll send out another survey. Look out for that. Um, the idea is that I hope during week 13, we can schedule meetings. So start thinking about times that work and look out for, uh, for another survey for scheduling. <sighs> That's it for the housekeeping. Now back to this reading, and we're gonna have a couple more readings, which I'll mention at the end. Stephen Heller presents this really interesting idea, the underground mainstream. <laughs> And in order to approach it, I wanted to go back to where we left off last week. This might seem like a very different reading, but I think it actually can, can dovetail pretty nicely. So who remembers where we left off at the end of week 11? The answer was Times Square, right? We were looking at the meaning that can be built into architecture. Remember learning from Las Vegas, we were looking through that article. Right, And we left with this image thinking about how much information can bombard us in a certain place. Here's another image from Times Square during the early days of lockdown. This to me is very eerie. There's no one even left to consume the images, but we're just in this world of messages, of meaning. Remember for, for Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, those messages are not only the billboard, Right? There's meaning in all sorts of architecture. It conveys all these different messages. There's connotations to certain kind of buildings. But in Times Square, we have very pointed messages and you can't walk through without hundreds of advertisements being projected onto you every second that you're there, right? Not everyone is happy about this situation, and many people have, uh, have objected to this in various kind of ways, some of which are referred to in the Stephen Heller article. 
One way you can do this is to directly uh, interject. And uh, this is a practice typically referred to as culture jamming. There's a few different forms, which I'll tell you about, but you can go onto a billboard and uh, you know, beginning in the 1980s and 1990s, when different printing techniques became cheaper and more accessible, it became pretty easy to intervene with a billboard and to, to, uh, to change the message for everybody walking by. So this is an example of a McDonald's ad um, that at first glance seems pretty ordinary, but then you realize that the message which had formerly been you have about 10,000 taste buds, use them all, can very quickly be converted into kill them all. Uh, and then the I'm loving it logo can quickly become I'm sick of it, right? It sort of, it, it's something that is almost missed, but once someone recognizes this, they see that yes, this advertisement is selling them a lie. And maybe there's a possibility for uh, revealing some truth with a very minor intervention. Or another one that's even more simple is a billboard for Stella. And you can imagine this advertisement used to say something like she is a thing of beauty, um, which in itself is objectifying, right? This is a statement um, wherein in, in this billboard we see um, even without the text, we can tell that the man pictured here is objectifying the woman. Um, so by erasing one or two words, we can very quickly point to that fact and make it crystal clear exactly what the advertisers were doing. It's not a terribly new practice. This is something that goes back um, into the 1980s. Uh, Apple had a campaign uh, that was called Think Different. In this campaign, there was a sort of strange cultural phenomenon where Apple was using the images of known historical figures who lived and died before Apple computers were invented, but uh, Apple had acquired rights to use their images uh, to send messages uh, along the lines, uh, or at least a connotation along the lines that Amelia Earhart, for example, might have used Apple computers had she been alive today. Um, you know, in addition to sort of retroactively rewriting history, I think there's something a little bleak about this and other uh, commentators, other culture jammers at the time thought that there was also something bleak and the fact that Amelia Earhart uh, disappeared tragically. Um, so the idea of changing the message from think different to think doomed uh, calls attention to the business practices that Apple is, uh, is taking part in. And it, it, uh, it calls attention to some of the maybe misconceptions that their advertising campaign could be spreading. But again, the 1980s and 1990s were not the first time this was happening. Um, there's images from the 1930s um, where, where we see this occurring. Basically, the intervention in billboards is about as old as billboards themselves, right? This is a photograph by Walker Evans documenting some, uh, some culture jamming. This film, entitled Love Before Breakfast, like many films of the time, very casually uh, played with themes of domestic abuse. Uh, and the culture jammers at the time, who typically remain anonymous, use this billboard, and again, with something, a little marker or black ink uh, paint, it's very easy to walk up to the billboard and paint a black eye onto the, the woman who's the subject of the film and who is also being portrayed as, as, um, as the victim of domestic violence. So there can be a very powerful positive social message sent through this type of intervention. Whether or not it really changes uh, the nature of society is a much bigger question, but this is one possibility for, for culture jam. And in the 1930s, photographers recognized the messages in architecture and recognized some of the other ways in which it could be counteracted, it could be subverted to send a, a contrary meaning, to put out the sort of opposite of the status quo that was being conveyed. So a photographer like Margaret Bourke White was documenting poverty in 
in the 1930s. And she came across scenes like this one where we see a billboard that says the world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. And then a line of individuals uh, waiting uh, for food donations below this billboard. And the irony of the situation cannot be ignored, or maybe it's not even irony, maybe just the cruelty of the situation in which the American way of life is apparently only for the white people in America, where all of the people of color are standing in the bread line. There's a horrible display of inequality that becomes crystal clear. And this type of message, this type of image can send a very powerful message out to viewers who encounter it. On a slightly lighter note, um, this is, sorry, not the lighter note yet, um, <laughs> Walker Evans uh, documented similar scenes and sent them to press. And then on, on a lighter note, sometimes without having this very direct political message, you can just see that these disruptions point to the frayed ends of our social fabric. Sometimes something as simple as a torn movie poster, rather than sending a direct political message, might also offer opportunities to question the status quo in, in more subtle kind of way. And of course, the magazine page has also been an important place where alternatives to mainstream advertising design can subvert our understandings of the status quo. And another bit of culture jamming that was uh, taking place more on magazine pages and in posters, in the 1990s, The Gap conducted a campaign similar to the to the Apple campaign that I just mentioned, where historical figures who happened to wear khakis were featured in Gap ads in an attempt to sell Gap khakis. You'd have figures like Ernest Hemingway, who's this revered author, and yes, he wore khaki pants, so the Gap tried to use him. And the culture jammers here recognized uh, you know the fact that well adolf hitler wore khakis too and that doesn't look so good for the gap uh, so it's a sort of funny subversion or similarly in the magazine pages we see images like this one where joe camel who at the time was being marketed to adolescents uh, who was a sort of this cultural figure for teenagers and was used very cynically by the tobacco companies to promote smoking amongst young people. An ad like this shows you the, the opposite of the cool side of Joe Camel. It shows what really happens to Joe Camel, of course. Now, again, this form of culture jamming is maybe not quite as extreme as disrupting billboards and public spaces, but it offers an alternative view. And as Stephen Heller points out, Ideas like this one come from other sources like Mad Magazine. I hope, I hope everyone's had a chance at some point to flip through an issue of Mad Magazine. I think you can actually still buy like collections of like the classic comics. It's very cheesy. It's not, it doesn't really come across as some kind of high-minded, deeply intellectual kind of comedy, but it is a sort of funny reference point. And some of the puns are very obvious. Not that Joe Chemo isn't, but you, you see these kind of funny plays and it has been deeply in, influential for many artists and designers. And it's, it's certainly uh, worth a look. One group of artists, culture jammers who had been influenced by Mad Magazine formed a publication in the 1980s called Adbusters. They're still around, they still publish their work and they still stage some public interventions. And actually one of the options for reading for next week coming up will be uh, from one of the founders of Adbusters. The entire magazine takes the shape of a glossy newsstand magazine, but it's filled with counter cultural programming. It's filled with faux advertisements that mimic the style of conventional ads, but then also send out alternative messages that run contrary to what mainstream advertising wants you to think and wants you to believe. 
So McDonald's was always an easy target for ad busters and for anyone else in, engaged in culture jamming. And they've been one of the sort of primary targets. I think this is the third or fourth we've seen already because McDonald's sends messages, uh, maybe a little bit less so today, but historically they have sent messages that feature images of healthy eating, of family time spent together, of, of of a rich kind of cultural social fabric, all of which runs contrary to what McDonald's really serves up. They're also the biggest restaurant chain to be doing this. So they've served as a pretty easy target. But McDonald's has certainly been the target of plenty of culture jammers and Adbusters has uh, taken aim more than once at McDonald's. They've also taken aim at the fashion industry and companies like Calvin Klein. The obsession line of perfumes were and, and uh, colognes were very popular in the 1990s and featured advertisements including Kate Moss and other extremely thin models who conveyed a certain body image towards viewers. So Adbusters seen that this was probably unhealthy for, for most consumers, ran these ads that counter that narrative. And we can see at first it's very subtle. It looks almost identical to one of these Calvin Klein ads with the black and white soft focus. But we realize that the model is bent over a toilet um, in, in the, the process of vomiting out her, her food to remain unhealthily uh, skinny. Uh, so it sends a sort of counter message or, you know, funnier, I don't know which one is more obscene. I'm sorry, these are uh, not delicate, but uh, the obsession for men is a little different. And I don't think I need to explain much about what's going on here. Adbusters is not the only group to be conducting these culture jamming exercises. There have been plenty. Another group that has staged some interventions using all types of media and actually entering more into the video age, uh, cable news, and now the digital age uh, is, a, is a duo that call themselves the Yes Men. They've focused primarily on news outlets and have found ways to make their way onto the air and send out messages that run contrary to uh, to popular programming or to disrupt news cycles. Perhaps their most infamous intervention occurred on, on BBC News in 2004. This was a very controversial bit of culture jamming. Uh, the Yes Men, one of them uh, dressed up, created a website, created a fake email account, built up a whole backstory about credential, credentials and posed as, a, uh, as an executive from Dow Chemical. Prior to this, there had been a massive oil, uh, there had been a massive chemical spill in India that had, uh, in Bhopal, that caused a great deal of damage, uh, it, it sickened thousands of people uh, in the region. And Dow Chemical had up until that point taken no responsibility despite many protests, court interventions, and so on. So uh, Dow Chemical was uh, shirking all responsibility for this massive ecological disaster. The Yes Men found their way into BBC News, posing as Dow Chemical executives, and claimed that they were going to completely clean up all of the chemical spills and write the situation no matter what the cost would be. On one hand, Dow's stock dropped by double digit percentage points as soon as they were on the air, as soon as they announced this. Investors knew that there would be a massive cost and started selling off. The company almost went bankrupt in a matter of minutes. And it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar multinational company. So they nearly bankrupted the the company until it was, you know, until everyone realized that it was uh, a fraud. So that would have helped to uh, end the, the, the crimes that this company committed. On the one hand, 
On the other hand, they were criticized for this intervention because many people got their hopes up and thought that there would be uh, actual action taken by this company and were disappointed to learn that there wouldn't be. That wasn't a unanimous reaction. Many people sort of got their hopes up for a moment and then were glad that the yes men were calling attention to the issue even if it wasn't going to be solved. So there's a whole mixed set of reactions, but uh, this is really, I think, one of the more powerful bits of uh, cultural interventions, culture jamming that have occurred in the 20th century so far. On a sort of funnier, lighter note, again, uh, more recently, the Yes Men staged a campaign during a drought in California, calling attention to the fact that government officials were telling average citizens to take fewer showers and flush their toilet. Meanwhile, about half the water in California is used for agriculture, and a huge percentage of that is used for the production of beef. So they launched this campaign called Skip Showers for Beef, and they realized that if you skipped 115 showers, you could enjoy a quarter pound beef patty and use the same amount of water. There's some very funny videos. There were funny uh, street protests. They were on different news channels promoting this. Uh, this idea. And of course, it's completely absurd. So look up Skip Showers for Beef. There's some very funny videos out there. And it's another way that uh, that interventions uh, in mainstream culture can uh, disrupt the flow of information. Now, the funny thing, as we think about ways that culture jamming disrupts the mainstream, is that it's also something that can become mainstream. There's a particular example that stands out in my mind. In 2019, addressing the problem with uh, methamphetamine addictions in their state, the South Dakota government started a campaign with these posters that say, meth, I'm on it. They paid an agency, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry I don't have the information on this one, I should they created a poster and a print television campaign in which these posters that say meth, I'm on it, were sent up all over towns. And there's, a, there's an effort to sort of normalize the addiction problems, create something that will be a sort of cultural intervention, plays with this sort of advertising uh, stereotypes or tropes that you might see in, uh, you know, in, in ads for for cola or for uh, any other sort of, um, you know, these these campaigns that uh, have very even sort of like got milk, you know, playing with a very sort of simple, straightforward uh, advertising strategy to call attention to the fact that your neighbor might be addicted to these drugs and that ignoring it doesn't help, that talking about it might actually help to call attention to the issue and then eventually change the situation. So it's funny that these tactics can also switch from being an underground fight against mainstream culture to mainstream and government institutions using the same strategies to call attention to other issues. And this is exactly what Stephen Heller is talking about in the underground mainstream. He talks about psychedelic culture. That's partially because of the generation that he's from, but there's also some very obvious examples where you see how an underground movement that fought against the status quo rose into the mainstream and changed things dramatically. One very specific example from the psychedelic culture comes in the form of Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters. The novelist Ken Kesey, you may be familiar with One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He was an immediate literary sensation. But before his fame, uh, he was the subject of government experiments where they tested LSD. And following that time, he continued to uh, ingest a fair amount of, well, not fair, he ingested a lot of LSD, and he created this gang that went out and sort of just created chaos on the countryside. They were sort of all about bringing joy and mayhem everywhere they went. Oddly, at the time, LSD was so new that it was not yet illegal, 
but they were arrested several times for their disruptions. And some members were, were also institutionalized. Um, you know, they were, they were thought to be, you know, the term back then would have been clinically insane or something, but they, they were institutionalized for their, for their antics as well. And this was a real serious disruption. It was a bus full of hippies in 1964. So very early, almost before the hippie movement that were just sort of disrupting uh, the norms of society everywhere they went. By 1967, the biggest band in the world, the Beatles, also went out and purchased a bus and recorded a record called Magical Mystery Tour. Now it was still fairly radical, but it was on a major label. And there was a video that aired on primetime television, uh, hour long promoting this album. They made like this little film out of it. So it absolutely seeped more into the mainstream culture and became much more palatable. Teenagers were buying records of this gang of, of hippies driving around on a bus. And then in 1970, I believe it was ABC, created a sitcom called The Partridge Family, in which a very happy, joyful family drives around in their bus and uh, tours playing these sort of uh, fun rock songs. And of course, this is the most mainstream, most palatable, absolutely nothing rebellious or countercultural about it. And we see it in just a few short years, we go from something that's really radical to something that is, that is generally acceptable and very joyful and fun for everyone uh, in society, the, the most palatable, acceptable kind of cultural production you could possibly have. And this is ex exactly what, what Stephen Heller's talking about. It comes in all forms. Another example that takes us from the 1960s. Remember when, when I talked about postmodernism, I showed you this image from William S. Burroughs, who was extremely radical in his time and you know, remains radical in the literary world. In 1994, Nike with Whedon and Kennedy uh, acting on their behalf, created a series of advertisements using William S. Burroughs and he's sort of reading from his literature to sell Nike sneakers. Nike is, is particularly interesting when it comes to these kind of uh, cultural dynamics. Nike loves to establish a sort of countercultural cachet and always has been, but at the same time, they're the biggest sneaker company in the world. In the 1980s and 1990s, they were the target of much culture jamming largely for the fact that they were one of the first uh, clothing manufacturers to start manufacturing uh, their product overseas where there was lax labor laws. So while they're trying to uh, trade in on all this cultural cachet and working with celebrities to promote the brand, there were also children halfway around the world making Nike sneakers. So there was a great deal of backlash and of course, they were also the biggest company, so they bore the brunt of it. If you want the full story about Nike and, and their, their history, the real the book to look at is called No Logo by Naomi Klein. And it's actually probably the best book on culture jamming you'll ever find. If you're interested in the subject, I highly recommend it, but it's largely about Nike, obviously a bit about McDonald's. And it, it's a really excellent piece of journalistic writing, No Logo by Naomi Klein. And Nike is also particularly problematic because they use not only youth culture, but they've historically used black youth culture, essentially going to the streets of Brooklyn and all throughout the rest of the city and Chicago and every other urban area across the country, watching what kids were doing on the street, recognizing that these kids were much cooler than everyone else, and then stealing their looks and, and kind of creating a brand built around that. And many people saw this as a sort of form of cultural appropriation. On the other hand, some very underground hip filmmakers uh, were happy to, to jump on and, and help out with that. And there was backlash uh, back in the 1980s when Spike Lee started working with Nike. 
he had he had just uh, she, he had just made she's got to have it and uh, was was you know the hottest filmmaker in the world and then suddenly he's uh, collaborating with Nike to make advertisements and there was this idea that maybe he had sold out maybe he he had betrayed some of the kind of uh, uh, the ideals that he had held when he began as a filmmaker. Again, this is, it's an open question as to whether he did, right? Everybody has different takes on what it means to be underground and what it means to be mainstream. Can you be true to your art when you go mainstream? Can you really, uh, can you really have a vision that's uncorrupted, that's pure, that's where you can really make your art without interruption or will corporate uh, sponsorship dilute what you do? Will it water it down? Will it make it palatable for everyone? It's a tough set of questions. Another example that I like to point to, uh, which goes back to the sort of photo and, and art world is Barbara Kruger, who in the 1980s started making these bold black, white, and red images. She, she would find old photographs, sort of chop them up and then paste slogans over them, always using Futura and some combination of uh, red, black, and white. This is one of her more famous ones, I shop, therefore I am, presented as a very sort of ironic statement. And then she also kind of appropriated her own images to make things like shopping bags that, that convey the same message and do it sort of ironically because you're going to go shopping with it. And if you're thinking that all of this looks familiar, it's because it does. Uh, companies like Supreme have built entire brands based on this type of messaging. Um, Barbara Kruger has words for, for the founders of Supreme. They're actually very funny and inappropriate for me to repeat here. But if you look for Barbara Kruger Supreme, you'll see a very, uh, a very sort of colorful description of her thoughts on, on what Supreme does. So that's another way that the work of one artist can be co-opted and become the mainstream through, uh, you know, through the work of another artist, essentially. Okay, I know we've pointed this idea towards our potential topics for the final. And we're gonna be spending a lot of time thinking about the final in the coming weeks. So I wanna do one more thing that's really outside of that. And I think that's sort of fun because I think that this is also a topic that creates really interesting conversation and, and has a sort of um, diverse range of applicability. So, the discussion for this week, I would, you, I would like you to choose something that is outside of design, that doesn't have to do with the design world. And tell us what is the cool underground thing that is going to go mainstream or that you don't want to see go mainstream? What, what is the coolest thing out there that no one knows about that maybe you hope doesn't sort of get that mainstream attention? or maybe you know it's about to, and maybe it's a good thing if it does, okay? It's, the format for this discussion is gonna be totally open. You can, uh, you can just type it up. You can share images, which are always appreciated. You could share a video. You could record your own video talking about it. However you wanna present this discussion, it's up to you, okay? I'm gonna give you a quick teaser for my underground that, I actually want this one to be mainstream. And I'm thinking about uh, the group called Extinction Rebellion. They're starting to go mainstream. They actually staged some interventions just last weekend. For Earth Day, they were out on the streets. They're a protest group. They're not afraid to be arrested if it means calling attention to issues of climate change and environmental degradation. A group of protesters actually sat, sat outside the printing offices, um, the printing presses for uh, several major newspapers on Friday morning to call attention to the fact that the media doesn't give nearly enough coverage to uh, environmental issues and to uh, the climate change crisis. So they're out there on the streets. This is actually from Washington Square Park over the weekend. Uh, it was a small group gathered, but I want, I want to see this direct action protest group 
all over the headlines. They were starting to gain momentum before the pandemic and they've said their numbers have dwindled a little bit, but I hope that this underground group becomes more mainstream as we, as the climate crisis starts to come to everyone's attention. And so your job for the discussion is to tell us another thing, no design, it could be music, it could be fashion, whatever, it could be a novelist, whatever underground cultural production you're hooked on right now, tell us a little bit more about it. That's the discussion. The assignment for next week is your final reading and there's a little twist to it. You're going to read two essays from the graphic design theory text that most of our readings come from, but you can pick from a number of different essays, okay? The first one is by Ken Yohara. You may know him as the, um, the branding director for, for Muji. It's sort of about how design will thrive in kind of like an anti-technology type of way. Or you can look at this text called Dematerialization of Screen Space by Jessica Helfand, talking about ways that design adapts off of the page and onto the screen, how it has changed since the days of print magazines and has changed for all the screens we interact with now. You can choose Design Anarchy by Kali Lazen. Kali Lazen is one of the founders of Adbusters. So if you're interested in this topic, then that's a great one. If you think it'll be relevant for your, uh, for your research, for your presentation, even better. Universe Strikes Back is an essay by Ellen Lupton, who we've encountered a couple times, and her sister, Julia Lupton, who is a literary scholar. And they address some of the ways in which the ideals of modernism might come back might sort of resurface in the 21st century. Or this article by Lev Manovich, Import, Export, or Design Workflow and Contemporary Aesthetics. In this essay, Manovich understands the very simple commands on your computer, import, export, copy, and paste, and takes them as something that's not just a sort of happenstance of, of how we work, but is actually the core logic behind how design is conducted today. Designing Our Own Graves talks about prosumer culture. Dimitri Siegel in this essay looks at how easy design has become and how accessible it is to so many people and wonders by making design so easy and accessible, are designers actually putting themselves out of work? Or, or finally, uh, Design and Reflexivity by Jan von Torn is the, one of the more difficult philosophical texts we might encounter. And it looks at the ways that media culture shape images and essentially change our mindset and some of the ways in which design can do that. So those are the readings that you can choose from choose at least two. You will not respond in paragraphs. You're gonna state which ones you've read and then start offering up more sketches for your final. Again, look at the instructions on the post. More soon, can't wait to see the discussion and can't wait to see how you're doing on the final. Thanks. <laughs>